to turn tonight to God's Word and in um, chapter 13 of Luke's Gospel. And I'm going to read from verse 10. God's Word, Luke chapter 13, <coughs> and we're reading from verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. That's Jesus. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, <clears throat> thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, in them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite! Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead them away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Verse 17. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. We were just singing about love lifted me, and the message tonight is about the woman that was bowed down together. You know, it was the love of God that, that reaches us, when you're unsaved and dead and lost in sin, it is the love of Jesus Christ. Whatever way I think of it, it was the love of God that reached me. It was the love of God that saved my soul in November 1979. When I was praying for a message for the Sunday night meeting for here, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I need to know that this is from, from you and it's for the people that will be there on that night. And one of the things that hit me when I was going over this portion of Scripture, this woman was bound by a spirit of infirmity 18 years. And I was 18 years old and three months the night the Lord saved me in November 1979. And I can honestly say that I was bound by the devil all those 18 years from the time that I knew how to do wrong. I was bound by the devil and I didn't see the light of God. I didn't see God's sky. All I saw was the darkness and the wickedness of the lifestyle that was mine all through those years. And I look at this story and I see the similarities. The Bible tells us in verse 10, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. How can we fathom or measure or begin to understand the love of God for sinners lost and dead in sin? The love of God is incredible. I remember going up to Donegal and visiting uh, some people who'd lost their sons in a horrific car crash. And I was so conscious of the fact that I couldn't see what, what you know, these people were going through. But I remember saying to one woman, I said, I have no idea what you're going through, but I know who does. I know the one who does. And I could say that. I could say that with conviction. And the Lord sent me from the bottom of Ireland up to the top of Donegal to tell that woman. And the verse that I shared with her was, he healed the broken in heart and he binded up their wounds. And our land today is full of broken-hearted people. 
Why is it when we even look in our Bibles and we read these absolutely incredible stories when Jesus was going through Jericho, the crowd pressed upon him. <clears throat> this man that wanted to see Jesus was a very, very small man and he was a tax collector. He was going to get no favour from the crowd in getting in to see Jesus. And he climbed up into a sycamore tree. All the people that would have pressed on Jesus, even physically, because of the, the intensity of the crowd, one man, one man benefited from his visit. And here we see his teaching in the synagogue. There would have been all sorts of peoples there. And of course there was the religious leaders. And here was this woman with a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and she was bowed together. <clears throat> the thing that strikes me about this woman, everybody would have seen her condition. Everybody would have noticed her condition. It would have been abundantly obvious. But you know, across our land today, and maybe here tonight, as people bow down with sin, sin and wickedness and evil, living your life without Christ. I was saying to my brother on the way to the meeting tonight, I said, one of the, uh, one of the worst horrors of hell has to be, why didn't I just say sorry? Why didn't I just tell God I was sorry? That has to be, that has to be one of the worst horrors in hell, to think that salvation is free. It's a gift from God. Now, God isn't going to twist your hand to take it. And God isn't going to force you to get saved. He offers you his salvation. He freely gave himself on Calvary's cross. He died in our rightful place. He suffered in agony in our place. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. Such is the love of God for us. Such is the mercy of God for us. And he holds out the offer today. As I said this morning, this day is a day of good tidings. Tonight is a night of good tidings if you would reach out and take the benefit of what Christ has done. If you're here tonight in this meeting place, maybe you've gone to Christian meetings, maybe you've been at several Christian meetings, but I would ask you tonight, are you saved? No ifs or buts, are you saved? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? Can you say that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If you have any doubts as to those questions tonight, you're in a very, very difficult position. You're in a very dangerous position. Because if you were to die tonight and you're not right with God, this message will be an absolute terror to you in hell. Because you could have been saved. You can be saved. You can turn to Christ. You can avail of his mercy tonight because God is merciful. And I thank God I'm not speaking about some academic message or thing that's, you know, I've learned this and I, I, I study this in a, in a college or I read it out of a book. I'm speaking from my own experience. You see, this woman was physically bound with this spirit of infirmity and she couldn't even look up. Her back was bent. She had to turn her head sideways. And the Bible tells us she had this spirit of infirmity bowed together for 18 years and she couldn't, she could in no wise lift herself up. How many people who are going about their lives and they're not saved and they don't realise you can't lift yourself up. You can't make yourself right with God. There's nothing you can do to earn the favour of God of yourself and by yourself. <clears throat> There's nothing you can do to appease God. There's God's wrath against sin. There's nothing you can do that God would change his mind and say, now I'm satisfied with you. You see, what God accepts and what God only will accept is what his son has done on Calvary's cross. God accepts the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his blessed son, once and for all, never to be repeated. That's what God accepts. And you see, for you to benefit from God's mercy and from God's salvation, you have to accept what Jesus has done on the cross. You have to come to him as a sinner. You know, you might be physically fine tonight with no visible defects like this poor woman. Everybody would have seen this woman. It was very obvious <coughs> what was wrong with her. But you know, you could be here tonight and you're bowed down with sin. What is the sin that's worth hanging on to that will take you to hell? Is it worth going to hell for is it worth going to a lost eternity for that sin? You know, you can come to the Lord and you can say to him and be honest with him and say, Lord, I, I can't save myself. I can't lift myself up to you. Just like that woman couldn't straighten herself. 
but I'm coming to you by faith tonight and by faith in your word. I do believe that you died on the cross. Our brother Seamus will be with us in the outreaches and he's in the Turles area and they go down to the highways and the byways and you know the, the, the narrow roadways take more time but he's inclined to go down to these roadways and he met this old man in his 80s living on his own and he's just recovered from a stroke. And Seamus said at the door, he waited at the door, and he was being led by the Spirit of God, and eventually this old man came out. And he started talking to him about Jesus, and he said, I have great news for you. And he said, you know that Jesus died on the cross? And he said, I do, he said, I do. But he said, you know that you can be saved by asking him to forgive you your sins. Have you ever been told? He said, no, I was never told that. Never told, never heard that. And there at that house of that, that old man, he held his hand and he said, before he prayed for him, he said, have you any reason, can you think of one good reason why you shouldn't ask Jesus to save you from your sins? And the old man said, no, he said, and he asked him to save him there and then. Myself and brother Pat Cribben were down in a place called Lockgore, a beautiful scenic area in the county of Limerick, East Limerick. And we were coming away from Lockgore and I thank God for people who are open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you see, when I was talking to this farmer in his jeep, and I love these country areas because, you know, the farmers and the jeeps, they can actually park anywhere. And this jeep was parked in the middle of the road, so just too bad if people were passing. So I, I stopped up this fella and I started chatting to him. I was like a pig in the muck, talking to this farmer in his jeep. And Pat, of course, decided I'm going to use my time wisely. And over he went to this house. And there was a dear old lady called Mary O'Donnell. And Mary O'Donnell was in her 90s well into our 90s. And he started talking to her about the Lord, talking to her about God's salvation. And we had finished up our business. We were heading back home, heading back home. And Pat said to me, he said, Jerry, he said, would you mind going back to that old woman? And I wasn't in his situation at all. But I said, no, he hasn't said that for nothing. So I turned the car around. I went back. And out came this dear lady. And she had heard the gospel and I said, is there any reason, would you like to ask Jesus to save you? I would, she said. She'd never heard it in 90 whatever years. Never heard the simple, plain gospel of Christ's offer, of forgiveness, of salvation. And I thank God for my brother who said, would you ever go back? Would you mind going back to that woman? He said, the Holy Spirit is able to lead us if we're listening. If you're here tonight and you're not actually saved, you haven't had your sins forgiven, you know the Holy Spirit God is speaking to your heart now, knocking on the door of your heart. He wants to save you. If you want proof of the Lord's desire to save you, you need to look at the cross. You need to see what Jesus suffered. You need to see what he endured. He, he, he despised the shame, the Bible says. Jesus on the cross of Calvary was, was battered and bruised. And that, that, that crown of thorns upon his sacred head and his back beaten like a ploughed field and hanging on that cross held by nails but was the love of God that towards us sinners that put Jesus kept him on that cross and Jesus died in agony for you so that you could be saved so that I could be saved and I thank God for the realisation of that it's the quickening of that truth by the Holy Spirit to our hearts that brings us to the realisation what are you going to do with the crucified Saviour? What are you going to do with Christ's sacrifice on Calvary's cross? Are you going to keep him at arm's length and say, well, I have my religion and I have my own belief? You'll never be saved that way. You've got to come to Jesus as a sinner. You've got to lay down your arguments at the feet of the, of, of the Lord Jesus and you've got to say, Lord, I'm only a sinner. I don't feel like a sinner. It's not about feelings. It's about faith. It's about believing the word of God. Believing and trusting in the word of God. And this dear woman was there and she was bowed together for all these years. And I love those words. It says in verse 12, And when Jesus saw her. And when Jesus saw her. There's no one here ever found God of themselves. No one can ever testify to finding God. God found us. If you're saved here tonight, God found you. And God found me in November 1979. And I was lying in my bed this night and I had one friend on this earth. That's a fact. My father and mother loved me, but they were burnt out. They didn't know what to do with me. It was a hopeless case. My father was at wit's end and my mother was a nervous wreck. 
And the night I was saved and it was lying in my bed, God filled that little tiny bedroom with his presence so powerful. And I heard the word speak to my heart, Jerry, I love you. See, I talked about the love of God. It's the love of God that saves lost and dying souls. It's the love of Jesus Christ that can melt the hardest heart. Would you let the love of God melt your heart tonight? I was lying in my bed, and when I heard these words, Jerry, I love you. I, I, I thought, how could God love me the way I live my life? I didn't understand. I thought that God loved the nuns, and God loved the priests, and God loved the religious people. But I couldn't understand, how could God love me? And I answered, I answered in my heart, and I said those words. I said, how could God love me the way I live my life? God spoke to me and he said, if I didn't love you, he said, I could, take you, I could have taken your life many times. My life flashed in front of me like a video and I see the things I'd done, some of the things I'd done that I wouldn't be proud of, wouldn't want to remember. And I said, the fact that I'm here in this bed now, lying in this bed now, God must love me. The fact that he didn't take me in my sin. He didn't take me and wipe me off the face of this earth. And what did that do to me? It caused a, a, a reaction in my heart. And my heart was broke open in two. My heart was as cold as stone. You wouldn't have brought me to a funeral. I wouldn't have been any good at the gravesite. I had no natural feeling. I was as cold as granite. And that night my heart was broken in two. And I cried my rivers. Rivers of tears flowed down my face. I was so sorry for my sin. I was so sorry for the way I'd lived my life. And I just said these words. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Will you give me another chance? I hadn't one Bible verse that I could quote. I hadn't gone to a gospel meeting. I can't remember someone stopping me in the streets telling me the way of salvation. God came to me that night. And when Jesus was in this synagogue on that particular occasion, he knew that woman would be there. And her expectations mightn't have been great that night as she came in with great discomfort into the synagogue and Jesus was teaching. And I thank God for it says in the scripture, and when Jesus saw her. And I can tell you tonight before God, the Lord Jesus is looking into your heart right now. And he wants to take away only that which will take you to hell. He wants to take away your sin. He's dealt with it. He's done it all. It's finished. He paid the price in full. Never to be repeated. It's over. It's done. It's done. Jesus did it all on Calvary's cross. And all he wants for you tonight is to open your heart to him. Maybe you're a borderline Christian. You'll not get to heaven by being a borderline Christian. You're either in or you're out. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either forgiven or you're not forgiven. You might have all these types of arguments. I find witnessing to people very often the case is that everybody has a unique situation. And of course what they're doing is they're using their unique situation to explain why they're not saved. And this happened to me 40 years ago and that happened in our family and all these excuses. Sin. Sin is the problem. Sin is the issue. Sin is the very thing that will keep you from God's heaven. Sin will separate you from God. And sin has separated you from God all your life if you're not saved tonight. And what does Jesus want to do? He wants to take away your sin. When Jesus saw this woman, and I don't know whether she would have been in a position to see him, but she surely would have heard him. The Bible tells us he called her to him and he said to her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. There's no words of any hymn, there's no poem, poet, writer could ever describe the greatness and the vastness of the love of God to sinners. The love of God is, such, is so wonderful. I thank God for his wonderful love and we're singing it. Love lifted me. I had no identity. I was a lost sinner. I was a hopeless case. I was absolutely heading straight for hell. And I'm certain that had God not saved me that night in November 1979, I'm certain I'd be in hell today. And I thank God 
that I'm not in hell right now because of grace. You know, the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2, and Paul is speaking, he says, for by grace you are saved. And what is grace? It's the favor God gives to sinners that they don't deserve, can't deserve, never will deserve. It's the unmerited favor of God. For by grace you are saved. True faith. <clears throat> faith in the word of God. Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believing that it's true that Jesus died. Believing that it's true that he took your place. Believing that it's true that he stood in for you on that cross. He bore your sin, my sin in his body on that cross. And then it goes on to say, not by works. Not by works. You can't do any work for salvation. You can't do any work to get into God's heaven. I'm a good person and never harmed anyone. You could say, oh, I've lived a good life. I've, I've, I, I've never had problems with my neighbors. I try to mind my own business and I try to do an odd good deed. That's okay for this world, but it won't do for heaven. It won't get you into God's heaven. To get into God's heaven, you must come to Jesus. And you have to come to him as a sinner. You can't come any other way. You can't come in any negotiations, no ifs, no buts, just as a sinner. And this woman was so obvious, the, the state that this woman was in. It was so obvious. But you're here tonight, it might be so obvious. You may not know yet the conviction of God the Holy Spirit. I pray that God would send conviction of sin, conviction of righteousness, and conviction of judgment. I pray that prayer over and over and over again. Nobody will come to Jesus Christ without conviction of sin. There has to be conviction of sin. There has to be an uncomfortableness. There has to be an uneasiness. There has to be a concern when you put your head down in that pillow. If you're not saved tonight, where are you going to go if you don't wake up in the morning? I'm telling you, you'll go to hell. You'll go to hell. God will honor what Christ has done. God always honors what his, what his son has done. And God will only accept what Christ has done on Calvary's cross. And for you, or for anybody to get to heaven, you've got to come to Jesus and you've got to come to him on his terms. Jesus said to this woman, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Oh, the power of God. We sang this morning, Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. But if the truth be known, we don't believe it, do we? Do we really believe it? That Jesus can do what he did, to, what he did uh, 2,000 years ago. He can do the same today. He hasn't changed. He's the same. He's the same Lord. He doesn't change. Forever the same. He's the eternal God. He can do anything for those who just trust him and believe him. And the greatest miracle of all is the miracle of God's salvation. Do you want a miracle tonight? If you're not saved, ask the Lord to save you and you'll go home and walk in miracle tonight. You'll go home changed, forever changed by the grace and mercy of God. And I thank God that I had no, once I had no future, once I had no identity, and I thank God that he took me from that awful life of sin and he straightened me. That which was crooked, I was crooked. I was twisted. I was, I was warped by sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ straightened me out. The same as he straightened that woman's back. He gave me a brand new heart. And I could talk to people. I could sit with ambassadors in their embassies and tell them about the Savior. I thank God that if you want to have an identity and if you want to have a purpose in life, trust in Jesus Christ. He'll give you a purpose. He'll give you a reason for living. He'll give you a joy that you never could have uh, even dreamed of. He'll fill your heart with overflowing. He said, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Only Jesus Christ can give abundant life. He satisfied the desire of every living thing. He can meet your every single need. There's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing too hard for God. What a wonderful occasion it must have been when that woman was standing straight and she could see Jesus face to face. What a wonderful thing. That she, she, a woman who was bent down all those years. And I thank God that though I was 18 years at the time, I tell you I was 58 years 
because of the, the stuff that I was involved in. And I thank God that I got out of that bed a brand new person, brand spanking new. And, and my mother could see in the shortest of time that I was changed. And my father could see it over time that I was changed. Changed because of the love of God. Changed because of the mercy of, of Jesus. Changed because of the power of the forgiveness of God. And that message hasn't changed. And God, God's resources to save haven't been exhausted. There's not one iota of God's resources being used up. He is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to him by faith. And he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Someone said it and put it aptly, from the guttermost to the uttermost, Jesus saves. And I thank God he washed my tongue out that night had a filthy tongue. And I thank God that the name of Jesus is a precious name to me today. He is Lord. He is the King of Kings. He's my best friend. And he's my Lord and Saviour. And I thank God. You know, when I get into my car and I'm travelling, I know that he's in the car with me. When I go to bed at night, I'm talking to him before I go to bed at night. And when I get up in the morning, I'm talking to the Lord because he's ever there. And my wife is the same. I thank God that, that in my home, in the morning time, my wife will go into the extension and she'll have her time with God and she'll come out when she's good and ready. And she'll have her time with God and there'll be people prayed for and there'll be family members and there'll be tears shed. I know that's the case with my wife. There'll be tears shed and God is faithful to hear and answer prayer. We have a faithful God who is ever, ever true. We have a faithful God and he's fulfilled his, wo his word to you. But you've got to trust him. Don't be standing on the, on the outskirts of Christianity if you're here tonight and you're not saved. Don't be a skeptic with God. You'll be down in hell for all eternity and you'll be looking into the face of Satan and he'll be laughing and cursing at you for all eternity and all you have to do is say sorry. That's not the picture of a wise man or woman. All you have to do is say sorry to God. What's the big deal? What's so attractive about sin that we'll hold on to it so greatly? So firmly hold on to it that we'll be damned in hell for all eternity because we couldn't tell Jesus we're sorry for what he did on the Calvary's cross. I thank God for this dear woman who was straight and lifted up and Jesus said, Thou art loosed from thine infirmity and he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. I think this is dynamite. He laid his hands on her. You know, the night, I don't say this too often, but the night I was saved, I didn't know any form of how to communicate with God. All I had was prayers that I learned off as a young fella. I do confess I felt better when I said them because I thought, well, God will be happy if I say my prayers. But I didn't understand about being saved. I didn't understand about being born again. But the night I was saved, my two hands were straight up in the, in, in, in the air. I'd never forget it. That my two hands were up in the air, very same as a drowning man lying in my bed. And the one thing I remember is after a while, it took no effort to hold them up. I believe with all my heart that the Lord Jesus Christ was holding my hands the night that he saved me. He wonderfully, wonderfully came and touched me that night and saved me from the inside out. He washed my filthy soul that was lost and dead in sin and he gave me a brand spanking new heart with new desires and a, and a new home in heaven. I was heading for hell and he plucked me as a brand from the burning off the broad road that led to hell and he put my feet first and foremost on the rock Christ Jesus and secondly on the narrow road that leads to heaven. And I'm here tonight by the grace of God. I have no desire going around here, there and everywhere fulfilling meetings and so on. My whole desire is this. There's got to be someone listening tonight. There's got to be somebody that God is speaking to tonight. Please, I plead with you to listen to God tonight if he's speaking to you. You may not get another chance. You may not get another opportunity. Many years ago there was a brother, his name is Paddy McMahon. He was very, very good to me as a young Christian, very sound in the Word of God, and a very, very sincere Christian. And he took Bible studies in his house. I'm going back to 1982, 81, 82, 83. That's a long time ago now. And this young lad came in, he was very respectful, never caused any trouble, 
and listened to the gospel being preached. <clears throat> he sat down. He was so respectful. And after the meeting one night, but he was, he was hedging his bets. He was, he, was, he was hanging on, hanging on, waiting on, waiting on. And he just wouldn't make that decision. And one night he came out of the gospel meeting and one of his so-called buddies pulled up in a stolen car and said, come on, Eddie, we'll go for a spin. Come on, Eddie, we'll go for a spin. And he didn't have the strength of character to say no. He didn't have the strength of character to say, no, I'm not getting into that car. And he was decapitated a couple of minutes after getting into the car. He never went to another gospel meeting. You might say, well, that's not going to happen to me. You could go home tonight, I'll tell you, if you get home tonight, and you could put your head in your pillow and there could be a funeral arrangements being made tomorrow. Where will you go when you die? You'll be in heaven or hell before the undertaker is called. It doesn't matter whether there's nice flowers and a nice sermon at your funeral or whether there's a big turnout. You know the way they say, he had a great turnout, hadn't he? Great turnout. The turnout isn't going to make any difference to where you're going to go. Whether the funeral is expensive or whether it is a cut the corners, cheap arrangement, that's not going to make any difference. You're going to be in hell if you're not saved. And there's no preacher can describe what hell is like. Why would anyone in their right mind go to a place, that place called hell, when Jesus Christ did everything necessary to get us into heaven? He's heaven. And I thank God for his salvation tonight. And I look at these stories and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't want to be sharing something. If you're a preacher and you're ministering the word of God, sometimes you have difficulty because, you know, you can prepare a sermon and God can upset your, your preparations. And you could have a sermon prepared and the next thing gives you something else to preach on. You just have to do what your, the Lord is leading you to do. But when I saw this about the 18 years, and it hit me, it was 18 years old when, when the Lord saved me. And you know, my father lived to see me live for God. And I lived to see my father saved at the age of 66. And my mother was saved. And I spoke, I spoke at my mother's funeral. I spoke at my father's funeral. And I thank God that they're in heaven today. And I thank God for his great and wondrous mercy. You know, I'm here tonight. I'm greatly, greatly in debt. I'm in debt to God. I owe God everything. I owe him much praise and thanks for all he's done for me. And you know, if you're here tonight and if you're saved, you should be able to identify with this. We're behind in praising God. We're a bit behind in thanking God yeah. and praising him for all he's done. You know, how quick we are to get the shopping trolley out and, and go along the aisles of God's resources and I want this and I want that and we want this and we want that. But you know we need to stop and we need to say, Lord, I want to thank you for saving my soul when I was going to hell. I want to thank you, Lord, for your mercy to me. I want to thank you, Lord, for your intervention in my life. And I see, fellas, and this is what I'm doing in recent times. I'm making contact with fellas I went to school with 50 years ago. And I thank God I've met a few of them and I've shared the gospel through the gospel videos with them. Why is that? I want them to go to heaven. And most of them were far better than me in the world's eyes. They wouldn't have done a fraction of the things I did. And today they're not saved. And if you're not saved tonight, we're coming to the end of this message. You're on your way to hell. You can go out that door and you can say what you want family-wise. You can do what you want when you get home. Turn on this, turn on that. You're on your way to hell if you're not saved. And only Jesus Christ can save you. Only a fool would leave him outside the door of your heart. Only a fool would put it off for another moment. We cannot take God for granted. We cannot assume on God's grace. God's grace is here for us now. You know, thank God for that dear woman. The Bible tells us, when Jesus laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And I glorify God tonight, and I thank God tonight for his salvation to me. I remember one time, my head was under the bonnet of a um, transit van, and my co younger cousin was there, and the two of us were looking at this problem. I had a courier business. I did a, over a million miles in 22 years at 14 different vans. And I said to my cousin, I said, you know, Liam, I said, I'm a miracle. I said, I'm a walking miracle. And he looked at me, and he couldn't deny it. He said, you know, he said, you are right. He said, you are. You are. He had to admit it. 
because he knew what it was like. He knew what God did in my life. The testimony that Christ has given us. And you know, there's people here tonight and have a testimony. We can forget, can't we? Because it was a long time ago. But we need to remember again. Forget not all of his benefits. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And can I say this to you tonight, if you're a Christian, if it's fresh in your mind what Jesus did on Calvary's cross, because it is fresh in the mind of God, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and God the Father, it's very fresh in his mind what Jesus, his son, went through on Calvary's cross. And if it would be fresh in your mind, Christian, tonight, what Jesus has done for you, to be a little bit easier to share your faith, to be a little bit easier to give that push to that evangelistic outreach or whatever, or get that tract and give it to your neighbour. You know, go out and re meet, meet that person that you're afraid to meet and face your fear, but fear God more. And go and reach that person for Christ because you know something that's coming a time and you won't be able to. We're getting older. I'm not as sprightly as I used to be. It's harder to do some of the things I used to take for granted. And I'm more and more relying on the Lord. But as I said this morning, I pray to God. I said, Lord, I pray that you'd help me to meet every person that I'm to meet before I die. And help me to be a witness for you. And to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of people in this island who have never heard the gospel. You can dispute that with me if you want. I'm telling you for a fact. There are states in Dublin. There are states all over this land. And there are young people growing up and they haven't a clue about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the church has gone insular and they've enjoyed their meetings and they've in, they're singing a new hymn, you know, and they're clapping their hands and they're stamping their feet. And outside, precious souls for whom Christ died are heading, rushing into hell, into a lost eternity. God, give us a burden for souls. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, I plead with you, don't go home the way you come in tonight. I, I have no axe to grind. I know nothing about you, but God knows your heart. You're not here by chance. Maybe this, is, maybe this is the 20th time. Maybe this is the 10th time. Maybe you've had many opportunities. Will you take the opportunity tonight? And don't go out that door as you come in and get right with God and stop all your arguments, silly old arguments and excuses. Put that all aside and say, look it, I want to get right with God. I want to get right with God. It's not right what Jesus had to do and go through for me. And I want to put that right. I want to put that right. You know, if you've a debt and you owe someone something and you say, look, I'm going to get that sorted. And you do it because of peace of mind or whatever. And you want to do what's right. But look at the debt that we owe to God. Look what Christ did. Look what God did for us. He couldn't have done any more. He did everything. He gave everything for us. The love of God. God so loved the world. The biggest word in the Bible, that word so. God so loved the world. No man can describe it. No man can explain it. But the Bible tells us he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in closing tonight, I want to thank you for having me up here. And I thank God. I'm very grateful to God for being able to come. And I've been well looked after in the home where I'm staying in. And I thank God. I'm glad to see Bertie and Pat again. It's a blessing. And I thank God for keeping them all the years, down along the years. And God is blessing here. And God is working here. Amen. Keep praying. The powerhouse is the prayer meeting. Amen. The prayer time. This private time alone with God. You want to see God working. Every time I pray, God opens doors. Every time I pray, I, I get the leading of the Lord the, by the Spirit of God. No prayer, no work. No prayer, no blessing. You know, nice, you can have nice, you can get a new a song, you can they have songs now and you can sing one line 40 times until everyone is like a zombie. And then it comes to the word and they can't even hear it because their head is full of crap, full of nonsense. We need the word of God. We need the word of God as the centre of our, of our Christianity. And I thank God for his word. I had a daughter born with cystic fibrosis. We didn't know what to do. And she's, she's um, married now and in Dublin. And she stands up for her faith. And she's witnessed to, to many, many people. But the day she was born, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know how to cope with it. And God gave my wife Maureen 
the proportion of Psalm 22, Thou art my God from my mother's belly. And she was in hospital and she was crying her eyes out, wondering what's wrong with her little girl. And I was at home and God gave me the same verse. The Bible is a big book. It's a big book. God gave us the same verse. And that verse was written down on a piece of paper and put in beside our incubator. And everywhere she went, even to the children's hospital in Dublin, and the nurse knew that goes with her. That verse goes with her. God's word is powerful. And that girl has been kept by God down through the years and blessed. She shared there some time ago. I'd love if you, if you, if you, if you got the chance to see the video where she was sitting in her bed. And she said to the Lord, she said, Lord, I can't take any more of this. And just at the bottom of the bed, she felt that the bottom of the bed went down. And she heard two words. The Lord spoke to her. And he said, I know. He said, I know. And he provided a, a, a help for her, a, med a medical uh, intervention that has completely transformed her life. And she's witnessed to people that I would never get near to. And she stood nose to nose to them, proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he's the only saviour of sinners. So there's two types of people here tonight in closing. If you're a Christian, I pray that you'll be stirred. Now, I've put down some yellow cards at the bottom outside the door. And one card says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. It's a testimony of a man who got saved with cancer 30 years ago down in Bandon in West County Cork. And on the back of it is a song which is my personal testimony to the air and the tune of Galway Bay. And the other one is my personal testimony, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, forgive me my sins. I have something to ask of you tonight. Take every single one of those cards home, please. Take one, take two, take three or four or five and give them to somebody unsaved. If you've got nobody to give them to, say to the Lord when you go out of this meeting, Lord, give me someone to give these to. And I believe that God will bless his word. It will not return void. You know, we were coming here tonight and we were talking about the seed, the parable of the sower. And I said to my brother uh, Wesley as we were travelling with pulling the gospel trailer, the reason I have the gospel trailer here tonight is because I was instructed by Bertie Johnson to bring it. So that was that. So that's why I brought it here tonight. But um, I said to my brother Wesley, I said, the seed is good. And if you believe that the seed is good, there is good, gro there is good ground out there. And God will bless his word. May God bless you tonight. And if you're here and you're not saved, I'm available. And there's others here as well that would be available to help you out in any way possible to listen, share with you, or just to try and help you, to encourage you to come and put your trust to the in the Lord. But please, as you go out tonight, take one of those cards. Do not give it to a Christian. Give it to an unsaved person. It's the gospel, and they are the people that need to hear the gospel. I think our brother has a closing hymn. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you very much for having me. God bless you.